Good evening. Uh, thank you, Professor Ross. Thank you, Rina Fraticelli. Thank you to the Socrates Project. Thank you to McMaster University. And of course, thank you to my dear colleague, Professor Judy Fudge, uh, for having me here today. I'm honored to be here. Um, and I wish also to acknowledge that I stand on unceded traditional territory of the Mississauga and Haudenosaunee nations under the Dish with One Spoon <coughs> Wampum Agreement. And I think about how much more meaningful this uh, acknowledgement and the special responsibility of being on this land means when you at McMaster have just appointed a new chancellor, uh, Shanti Smith, uh, who is indigenous from the Kanakanaka Nation a uh, turtle clan, a place incidentally, Montreal, where I call home. Um, I've argued elsewhere that to discuss the future of work, we need to engage with the very real presence of our past and through rooted engagements with labor and land, start to rethink our futures transnationally. Uh, Professor Fudge's invitation and this book come on the occasion of the centenary of an institution that since its founding, as a specialized agency of the League of Nations and continuity as the first specialized agency of the United Nations, it centered social justice as essential to universal and lasting peace. One, uh, and it sets about to address, uh, since its start, the fraught and even uh, deeply contested issue that was native labor uh, since its uh, inception and in the process uh, made some telling and even contradictory decisions about whether and how it would deal with colonialism and settler power. And it identified anti-racism as part of its mandate before the UN covenants uh, and the Convention on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination was adopted um, and inscribed that vision into a vision of economic justice. It even formulated the first contemporary international standards on indigenous people's rights, including consultation before the current UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Uh, and yet it, uh, in this current moment, as it looks to the future, uh, adopted a declaration, the Centenary Declaration in 2019, that makes no mention whatsoever of racial discrimination and settler colonialism. So I've spent much of my life working in and around the International Labour Organization. I've done that because it is the only international institution where workers alongside governments and alongside employers have a constitutional and constitutive role to play. Uh, I think it has a unique and pivotal role uh, in fostering an alternative vision of transnational governance uh, on the future of work. But in this moment, this moment of rising fascism, this moment of deep discontent, I believe we need to be particularly vigilant uh, about safeguarding uh, and deepening the pursuit of international justice. And that means holding international institutions accountable as well to live up to their mandate. So my presentation is, uh, sorry, uh, if I click here, will it work? Yes, fabulous. So is about this book. And I would like to start uh, by um, focusing on uh, the people who care. Uh, so this book focuses on the standard setting, but I think it's important to recall that as the people who care for others, domestic workers have become accustomed not to be really seen, not to be really heard. Historical accounts remind us of the link between domestic servitude and slavery. Uh, and the persisting vestiges that are found in the common sense of the relationship, the dimensions that we take for granted uh, that emerged out of the status-based relationship, master-slave, master-servant. The many poignant sociological accounts of domestic work in post-colonial or post-apartheid states emphasize domestic workers invisibility, even as they perform the hard and dirty work that's associated with 
social reproduction essential to us all. The political economy literature stresses the extent to which domestic workers who are often highly educated and who of course have care responsibilities of their own leave family and home to travel abroad to provide care. All capture the extent to which this traditionally feminized work remains economically and socially undervalued. And none capture, I think, better this work uh, than domestic workers themselves in their own work. And so I'm going to read just a short passage from Fatima El Ayoubi's book called Prière à la Lune, Prayer to the Moon, a book that this domestic worker of Moroccan heritage living in Paris wrote while she was recovering from a nervous breakdown. And she consciously chooses to speak for, and I quote, all the Fatimas who work in the shadows alone, far from their families. Elayubi reminds us of the art that inhabits her back-breaking work. She says, many people do not understand what is art. I have always worked looking for the elegance in what I do. Even when I iron a shirt, I want to feel inside of me an aesthetic harmony. I iron shirts, I dust. I clean the world to admire the beauty and the cleanliness. This art to which I have applied myself nine hours each day all these years, no one sees it. When I come back the next day, I commence to suffer yet again in my body and in my soul. I am a woman who uses her body as her work tool. Nothing else is left. So how did this remarkable photo opportunity <laughs> for the outgoing director general of the International Labour Organization, Juan Somavia, come to be. It's not as if the ILO had never turned its attention to the regulation of domestic work in its 100-year history. Uh, the subject came up repeatedly. 1936, 1945, 1948, 1965, when the ILO said it was urgent to turn its mind to addressing an issue that turns on the self-respect and human dignity which are essential to social justice for domestic workers. Uh, there are currently 67 million domestic workers worldwide, mostly women. Uh, of the 11 and a half million migrant domestic workers, over 78% are women. Uh, and despite uh, this magnitude, well, let's compare this magnitude to another category that the ILO has standard set on repeatedly since its foundation, maritime industry workers. Uh, there's one million of those. And it may seem a counterintuitive comparison until you think about the fact that both work and live in their workplace. Both are in deeply global industries. Both need to uh, work outside of their home state. Uh, and both uh, need uh, a form of regulation that steps outside of the traditional paradigm of labor relations. No one said we can't regulate maritime industry workers who are overwhelmingly male. Right? No one said this falls outside of familiar paradigms, so we'll just exclude them. They were actively uh, uh, engaged, uh, and uh, the ILO's decisive 2006 Maritime Labor Convention became uh, uh, an exemplar of the kind of uh, 
uh, work that could be done uh, when a deep understanding of the industry and deep interest in the industry combined with uh, thoughtful um, approaches. Uh, but I can assure you that when uh, for the regulation of domestic work we started to look at some of the innovations in the maritime labor context, there was deep concern. <laughs> I was like, no, this can't be right. This can't be similar. This can't be, except it really is. But basically, so you've got uh, uh, a huge workforce uh, and one that has fall fallen outside of the international labor code for a long time. And the framework uh, for many came down to this. These people look like workers, but they do reproductive work. They don't really have a working class consciousness. This is actually a different realm, family law. And each of those myths had to be challenged, right? quite seriously challenged, in order for standard setting uh, to get off the ground. But the strongest challenge became that domestic workers themselves, after waiting for 90 years, said, we are workers. We deserve uh, to be included in a labor rights frame. And we are going to frame our claim literally in terms the, of the right, the human right, for inclusion. Uh, in labor law, and they mobilized. So a group of workers isolated in individual households coalesced first in cities, then nationally, then regionally, and their very strong organization of domestic workers' rights along regional lines, and then they formed an international first network of domestic workers. It's currently a trade union federation. And through that mobilizing, domestic workers called on the global union federations, called on the International Trade Union Confederation, called on NGOs and a range of policy advocacy groups that surrounded the ILO and said, it's time to standard set. And at the ILO, there was a certain degree of consternation. But some states, including essentially states from the global south that have had, had to grapple with what it meant to have significant domestic work populations at a moment where they needed quite significant change. South Africa stands out amongst them as one where when it moved away from political apartheid and started revising labor laws, knew that they would not be able overnight to change the work that was so deeply associated with apartheid uh, and move all of those workers out. So they had to take up the challenge of making the working conditions decent working conditions. And so they had considerable experience with the standard setting. And at the ILO, it was actually the South African labor minister who said, my mother was a domestic worker. This is crucial work. This is something not only that is crucial, but it's something that actually can be done. We have the examples. We need to do this. Uh, and so the mobilizing led to the matter coming to the ILO's uh, table and led uh, to uh, the International Labor Organization needing to deal with how this work and this standard setting challenged its very structure as well as its understanding of its international uh, corpus. Uh, let me just uh, say in relation to that as well, that when one looked around the floor of the ILO during the standard setting, it became apparent uh, that although there are constituencies of workers, employers, and governments, 
For domestic workers, each one of those consist constituencies looked very much like constituencies of employers of domestic workers, right? And they sat on the sides. Uh, and when they had an opportunity to speak, they spoke. But mostly, they held the constituencies accountable for looking closely and carefully at their claims. So this slide uh, is a slide that speaks to the issue of uh, really origin stories. Um, having uh, grown up with a sense of the power and militancy of women who come from marginalized communities, I was uh, struck by one of the challenges that I have previously mentioned, and that is the assumption that domestic workers didn't have a working class consciousness and consequently would not uh, uh, be able to claim and operationalize uh, rights. And I've put this slide up here uh, out of an act of historical memory and as a way to recall that so much around standard setting for domestic workers was about linking older, deeper histories of labor and resistance. Right? So stemming from slavery, moving into the civil rights movement. When people think about the civil rights movement in the US, when they think of the Montgomery bus boycotts, for example, they don't usually conjure up domestic workers, except who was taking the bus every day? And who walked for miles to get to work to ensure that that movement was a success? The book that I've put up here by Premila Nadison is a beautiful text that chronicles the organizing of domestic workers, African American domestic workers, throughout that period, prior to that period, since that period, and is a poignant reminder of how much we lose in our narratives of labor when we exclude <coughs> deeply connected histories. Right. So this, ultimately, this retelling of the stories of how domestic workers resist, including domestic workers insisting throughout history on living out of their employer's house whenever they possibly can, right? That that is another instantiation of the kind of labor resistance that we um, sh need to take account of if we are going to be telling um, thicker, deeper labor stories. So this work was part of the work of getting a standard on the table. So this is the committee room that I alluded to, and this is what happens when I don't read, but I just, so I've told you this story already. This is this committee room, workers, employers, governments, and within uh, those constituencies, domestic workers um, had to operate almost on the margins as observers, uh, but they forced uh, constituents never to lose sight of just how central they were to this process and what they were doing. And what they were doing was un settling asymmetry. And this uh, presentation uh, focuses largely on the contra contradictory impulses in the framing of how domestic work for decent work for domestic workers has come to be uh, diffused. And one of the framings that I emphasize in the book is that a transnational legal order on decent work for domestic workers um, was built uh, not uh, to complement or sidestep or um, uh, just add a layer of regulation to a world of abundant regulations, right? The Domestic Workers Convention became convention number 189 for the ILO, right? It's 201st recommendation. There's an abundance, but there's a challenge to any serious standard setting which is the challenge of unsettling what's already there. In other words, not assuming that 
all we're doing is adding law where there is none, but rather recognizing the deep asymmetries that exist in an understanding of the law uh, that is perhaps non-state law, but is understood within the relationship. And this is something that I think is readily understood within a labor framework where we already think about the law of the shop as affecting the relationship with, between the parties and we understand its shared character across certainly an industry or a sector. Uh, domestic work is actually no different um, and that's been a core claim in the work that I have done and part of the work of the asymmetri asymmetrical law is to render domestic work curs needs uh, invisible, right? Uh, so that they are fully available for their employers and their employers don't need to care about their own needs for time off, for uh, to take care of their own families, for leisure, for security, frankly, they're there uh, to serve. Um, and so the standard setting was about challenging or unsettling um, that relationship um, and uh, articulating a way to um, regulate that would at once render the uh, asymmetry visible and move past it. And I cannot begin to tell you how many times I've had in other contexts to reference a simple provision in the recommendation that goes something like this. Domestic workers are not to be considered to be on their annual leave when they accompany the household mm -hmm. on vacation, <laughs> right? <laughs> but I'm literally looking at a case right now where you know the defendant is persuaded that that is the situation. Um, so n rendering visible the e implicit assumptions of the relationship to then change them, right? So to understand this then is to transgress the everyday law of the household workplace. Uh, and domestic workers already sought to do that through their forms of resistances um, and uh, the seeking this convention and then operationalizing it is part of that. So the convention, the recommendation, they were a tall order. They could easily uh, scare away the faint at heart. Um, uh, the claim though at the heart of them was simple and it resonated with domestic workers' social movements as well as those who took the time to understand why this work was so important. Uh, they emphasized the central dignity and humanity of caring for others. Uh, so domestic workers claimed the substantive equality right that was involved in being meaningfully included. Um, and uh, the significance um, was that the instruments then refused the purely symbolic and emphasized uh, this uh, substantive uh, claim. Um, one of the most compelling uh, of the transgressions then in the entire process from a legal perspective, I think from a geopolitical perspective, is that the comparative law learning on how one might regulate domestic work differently flowed not from the traditional historical way from the global north transplanted to the global south via the international, but rather much of the learning came from uh, the global south. I've already mentioned South Africa, places like Uruguay, 
uh, were also deeply influential because they too had turned their minds to a range of initiatives that would foster alternatives in labor inspection, for example. And uh, that uh, framing itself uh, was uh, an important challenge. Um, one of the other dimensions I will I mention in the book, and I confess this wasn't part of the standard setting uh, initiative, but was very much part of my quest to try to understand where uh, the law of the household workplace that felt so remarkably similar across so many deeply different parts of the world uh, and to, to get a, a better handle on, on why that was the case. And my intuition was that case law, you know, the place that lawyers tend to turn, might not be telling us um, or showing us as much as we needed to see. Uh, and that led uh, to turning uh, to a range of sources. So the book spends a fair bit of time with many of the ethnographies, uh, valuable studies that have been done uh, over decades now, uh, capturing the deep disadvantage faced by domestic workers over time. But it also led me to a rather surprising place. I've, of course, given it away with this slide. It led me to cookbooks. <laughs> and I thought, well, no. <laughs> All right, I'm a pluralist. I believe law is in many places. You can look to different sources to find law. But I had not anticipated cookbooks. And yet, when I thought about it, when I looked at some of these texts from the Victorian era, texts that traveled, a colonial cookbook on what it meant to be a housekeeper accompanying the husband who was a colonial administrator in India, someone whose mindset was they were doing in the household what their spouse was doing in the colonial administration. I thought, well, there's something here. And then, of course, remembering, as Carolyn Steedman's work allows us to do, that, of course, in the household economy, justice was meted out in the household, too. There were justicing rooms, which were a salon in the house where magistrates might mete out justice. What about the kitchen? So we know that there are very few artifacts, right, uh, from most domestic work. Children are cleaned, <laughs> and then they're not clean, <laughs> right? Meals are cooked, and then they're gone. Uh, but cookbooks remain. And I opened some of these cookbooks and lo and behold found things like the law of the household, literally, right? Master's responsibilities to servants, servant's responsibilities to masters. One of those was always bigger than the other, but you know. <laughs> there was literally a self-concept of what was happening there, and it was that law was being made. Right. And so, of course, this led me down a rabbit hole, and I might have mentioned that this book took far too long to write. It took 10 years, not, you know, two. Uh, and this was one of the reasons, because I just kept looking. And some of what I found uh, was deeply moving, including books like this one, written not by the master or mistress of the household, but written by the servant, including African-American servants in the antebellum period and in the postbellum period. And Melinda, Smith, Melinda Russell's book is 1865 in the US, and it is referred to by a culinary expert 
as Melinda Smith's, and I'm so sorry, Melinda Russell's Emancipation Proclamation, right? And it's, so a, a beautiful book that in which she claims her recipes, these books are full of recipes, but also tells her story. And in many cases, you hear a voice through these cookbooks that is a mediated voice, but that gives deep insight into the character of the work, the invisibility, the expectations, and also in the interstices, some of the resistance. So anyhow, so the pluralist law of the household workplace has a long genesis, and um, it, uh, it has a long genesis. All right. So uh, the book moves uh, clearly beyond the ILO historically. Uh, it also moves beyond the ILO spatially. And it takes the, uh, I think, historic uh, moment, that is, the convention's uh, adoption, uh, very seriously. It looks through the way that the ILO mediates some of the most challenging questions, including questions linked to how to regulate uh, migration, uh, dimensions of labor, uh, agencies, uh, uh, responsibilities being circumscribed, prescriptions on requiring a domestic worker to pay fees. Uh, it pays close attention to the many dimensions of the everyday work relationship. Of course, rest periods, annual leaves, but issues uh, linked to the importance of having the terms in writing, uh, the need for contracts when, or off, written offers when domestic workers are migrating and for those offers to be enforceable uh, where they return or where they uh, um, land. Uh, uh, it addresses uh, prevalent issues like passports being taken uh, from domestic workers who migrate um, and a range of similar matters. Uh, and uh, on the day that uh, the, domes the Domestic Workers Convention was adopted, the first thing domestic workers did was hang out a banner that said, now ratify. Right. It's not enough to just have this instrument do something with it. And so the last chapter of this book looks at ways in which the domestic work relationship um, uh, has been changed by this norm, how some of the practices have been called into question um, around uh, this uh, standard setting. And I look at, or I'll briefly mention um, three uh, pivotal examples. One is in South Africa, uh, where, uh, so, so as I mentioned, South Africa's legislative framework was actually quite influential in the establishment of the standard setting. And uh, not only the text of the legislation, but also mechanisms South Africa has put in place to ensure that domestic workers uh, can seek enforcement of their rights and seek that enforcement in a particularly expeditious manner. So they have a uh, and not only domestic workers, many categories of low-wage workers. So the conciliation, uh, Commission for Conciliation, Mediation, and Arbitration can literally hear uh, a case within a few weeks and provide domestic workers with a mediated settlement in the same meeting, right? And if they decide to go on uh, for a longer uh, uh, arbitration, then uh, within a reasonably rapid time frame, nothing like the kind of times that we would, for example, look at here, right? And so that kind of uh, 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 initiative was deeply influential for the standard setting, uh, but South Africa has also drawn on the convention and recommendation to then 
work on deepening areas like the minimum wage, although they have a minimum wage, it's terribly low, uh, and to rethink how one uh, works on the minimum wage as well as to uh, address the issue of social protection, right, uh, social security rights. So, uh, so there's a dynamic relationship. Um, uh, how are we doing on time? Okay. We're good? Yeah. Okay. So the, the second example is in the framing around migration and slavery, right? And uh, thinking about how uh, some of the litigation, some of the attention, including in the European context, around uh, contemporary slavery and how one redresses uh, situations uh, that uh, uh, are forms of labor exploitation. And the instrument uh, convention 189 recommendation 201 uh, speak to the need of course to eliminate forced labor. Um, and have been taken up, taken up in international contexts as part of a corpus of standard setting uh, that is addressed uh, by those who deal with contemporary slavery. But an important difference that flows through the instrument is that it offers a positive labor vision on how you avoid situations of forced labor in the first place. In other words, it's an attempt to deal with causes and consequences so that you can avoid situations falling into uh, abuse rather than assuming that the norm is other and that uh, situations of exploitation are somehow distant aberrations, right? And so there's an important shift, I think, that's, that's possible in the framing or work with uh, instruments uh, emerging out of a labor tradition that say the emphasis needs to be on the entirety of the labor and migration relationship to ensure um, that conditions of um, security arise. Um, and this leads quite directly to a third uh, frame, and that is uh, the something that is frankly not in the uh, domestic workers uh, convention or recommendation, um, and uh, that I think was never uh, entirely far away, um, and that is uh, the uh, range of options uh, from a policy perspective that are available if one is dealing with migration. So the domestic workers convention, the recommendation, are not framed as migration instruments. If they had been, we might not have them. The fate of migration instruments uh, in international law has not been great. We, they're poorly ratified and often unidirectional ratification, sending countries rather than receiving countries. Uh, this instrument is framed in a way that ensures that it applies to all domestic workers. And what that means is that migrant domestic workers are covered by the entire instrument. There aren't degrees of coverage as we tend to find in migration conventions. Right? And so that's pivotal to ensuring that the, uh, the texts are, are actually able to cover the gamut of situations of domestic workers, whatever their migration status. Uh, and then there are specific measures that deal specifically with migration. Um, and there is even a tension 
um, in the recommendation to uh, diplomatic immunity. So dealing with that difficult challenge for, for states um, uh, uh, dealing with abuse in embassies or the like. Uh, but, uh, and the, there is a, an attempt through the text to deal with the thorny question of how then uh, states can operationalize this if they're thinking more beyond uh, bilateral arrangements, right? Uh, so the common approach is to say, all right, Philippines with Saudi Arabia, enter an agreement to improve the conditions and you can use some of the wording in the convention and try to do a few things like electronic transfer of, of salary payments and then uh, it'll all be, all be good. Uh, but of course that misses the broader geopolitical context, that misses the migration routes, it misses the fact that if circumstances bilaterally aren't working, so if the Philippines decides, right, we're going to ban our migrants from going to a country because of its conditions, it's too easy to be able to simply to source uh, domestic workers from other countries and that's of course what we're seeing now and so domestic workers uh, come through uh, countries like Kenya and the, or Ethiopia and they may come uh, not from those countries but migrate internally and flow through and then wind up in other countries with lesser protections and so the need for a broader approach that emphasizes a level of international cooperation and solidarity is clear uh, through this. Um, the convention does not take the ILO or other actors there. What it does though is create a framework that allows those kinds of discussions to occur uh, when the political will is uh, present for those discussions to undertake. And I think this is probably uh, the deepest challenge of the standards. It's also um, the, uh, the most pressing challenge, frankly. Um, so, all right, so the instruments were adopted on the 16th of June, 2011. We currently have 29 countries that have ratified. That may not sound like a lot when you've got over 180. However, for the ILO in this moment where standard setting had largely ground to a halt and ratifications were slim, it's actually very significant. It's also really significant that the uh, ratifications have come from most parts of the world and include many European states uh, that have uh, ratified. Um, Canada is in the process of analyzing all of the laws and all of our labor jurisdictions with a view to ratifying. So there have been campaigns in different, uh, in different uh, parts of the country uh, to try to make uh, this uh, a reality. Uh, and uh, the uh, related dimension, and one that I've hinted at throughout the presentation, is that the ratification is only part of the process. Uh, states that have not ratified have been actively involved in learning communities transnationally that involve the ILO, that involve the domestic workers federations, that involve a range of actors to try to change laws to ensure learning, including South-South learning about regulatory options. Um, and what I think the domestic workers associations have most been able to do is shift a consciousness around the work. They've been able to communicate that domestic work is work like any other, that it needs to be regulated, and that it is central to how we even begin a process of thinking about work differently, about centering care in work and knowing that that care has to involve the people who do the work themselves. Uh, that 
means thinking differently about relying on an overwhelmingly subaltern category of workers to do that work uh, and uh, leads to deeper rethinking. For labor law, it means uh, thinking very differently as well uh, about uh, what our paradigms include, but also about what happens when you start to include other paradigms. And I was terribly struck when uh, uh, a uh, labor lawyer who has uh, worked for a long time with some uh, quite traditional unions read the instrument and said, if domestic workers can get this much, what does it tell us about what we've been saying about what is no longer possible from a regulatory perspective, right? Maybe we need to re-root, refocus on why we have labor frameworks and what they are meant to include and, and start basically uh, thinking more carefully about what the margins uh, teach us about the center. So I'm going to close here with just one short quote. It's a quote by uh, Myrtle Whitbui, who is the president of the International Domestic Workers Federation um, and who was at the forefront of pushing for this uh, standard. Um, and she offered these words in 2010 after the first year of the two-year uh, negotiations at the International Labor Conference in Geneva were over. That first year was fraught. There was a lot of resistance to the idea even that this um, uh, standard setting would happen. And she had this to say. We have managed to bring domestic workers to the ILO. And I am sure you will feel the spirit and see the hope and expression on our faces. We wanted to show you the importance of domestic workers who contribute to building the economies of the world by looking after your families and your homes. We are sure that for the first time, the delegates of this conference could feel here and experience the unity among the domestic workers. And maybe we will convince you that united, we can move mountains. So thank you very much for your attention uh, and uh, i look forward to your questions and your comments i'm curious to know what you think might be the instrument for achieving the kinds of positive forward movements that you're talking about um, in, uh, in, 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 for example, with, with migrant workers and with the, you know, the move to labor period. You, you talked about, you know, how domestic workers have achieved this, mm. achieved this in 2011 and they should stand as a model for how we can move forward. But what do you think can be the instrument for achieving that? Uh, very interesting. Do you mean for domestic workers themselves, or more broadly well, for? I'm more broadly, but yeah. it, because you, you you were talking for a while yes. about, uh, about migrant workers as yes. well, and uh, discussing, for example, the situation in the Gulf states and so on. But I just wonder what you think, what could be an instrument for yeah. achieving greater. Uh, goals than we've so far achieved. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, that's a great question. I think a standard setting ha plays a pivotal role, and I do, uh, I worry when people uh, devalue the importance of international labor law because I think it's, it, uh, it is not a total response. <laughs> by any stretch of the imagination to the ills of the labor in the global economy. But what international labor law has offered is uh, a really strong line in the sand uh, around uh, how we should understand what is permitted and what is not permitted 
in relation to you know a, a, a broad swath of issues on corporate governance, on uh, trade relations, on um, migration, uh, and uh, and certainly you know at a very basic level as it relates increasingly to Canada on freedom of association, right? Um, so the international labor law is actually deeply contested, uh, I think because it offers one of the few uh, spaces, uh, the few sets of instruments um, that have a certain normativity that allows groups and courts and other actors to operationalize them transnationally. So I say this because I think we already have quite a significant corpus of international labor standards uh, that if operationalized could go quite far to shifting the way that we understand um, how uh, globalization should uh, should should function, and you know that of course is a huge statement and needs to be uh, narrowed down. The challenge has been to operationalizing that in meaningful touchdown points. It is happening in some discrete initiatives. One that I'd like to turn to or to point to is uh, around uh, uh, textile manufacturing in small developing states uh, through the Better Work Initiative, initially the Better Factories Initiative in Cambodia and now spread to a number of states where the ILO plays a role in terms of ensuring that in a countrywide certification scheme, uh, the la local labor codes are applied, but are applied in a way that is consistent with international labor standards. And the impact of that kind of initiative that combines trade with labor standards and attempt to improve conditions within uh, factories is, is, is pivotal. Are there problems with it? Yes, huge. One of the obvious ones is that we actually don't have uh, standards on living wages, nor is it obvious that you could have a standard that would be uh, applicable across the board on living wages. There are standards on how to fix minimum wages, how to set them, but, uh, but, but otherwise. So there's a dimension of that that uh, needs to be addressed. Um, and there, the response is probably that you need to go beyond the instrument that will fix things and think about how, if you turn your attention seriously to the transnational, including to institutions like the ILO as offering potential spaces, you can bring concerned constituencies together to negotiate or mediate arrangements, including terms for setting a living wage uh, in a sector uh, that is heavily traded uh, uh, in ways that you couldn't otherwise if you didn't have those spaces. And if that sounds far-fetched, look again at the maritime sector, because they're able to do that there. Right? And that is precisely the kind of role that the ILO is playing with the federations and with the international organizational migrate, uh, international maritime organization uh, to, to do that. So it's a long answer to your question, but it's because your question is such a good one and such a hard one. There's no quick fix, but there is a need to think in clear institutional terms about how you do uh, how you do something that we haven't really allowed ourselves to do so much of in labor, 
and that is to think transnationally uh, about local issues. The local remains hugely important, but the transnational becomes a way to leverage uh, uh, change um, across governance levels, much as domestic workers have done. Right? Scale up to scale back down to make sure that you're making um, uh, progress uh, toward uh, social justice. So. <laughs> Uh, so I have, yes. I have a two-part question. Sure. Um, in terms of um, the, the spread of the ratifications, yes. are there any uh, countries in the Global North that have ratified oh, yeah. the convention? Which yes. ones? I'm interested to know sure. like, how that's rolled out. Yes. And then the second part of my question has to do with Canada and whether you, you think that yeah. the ratification will happen. <laughs> and if so, yeah. what implications my crystal ball. <laughs> uh, but I mean, what, what is the what is the what yeah. is the feeling amongst the the community yeah. that is attending to the, to this review that's going on at sure. the federal level, and what yeah. implications do you think that will have for our living caregiver program? Mm, yeah, thank you very much for those questions. So first on ratification, yes. Several countries from the global north have ratified, and I won't have a perfect list for you here, but some include Switzerland, Belgium, Italy, Germany, right? And so there, there's been quite a movement uh, to ensure that this becomes part of the framework, and the, both the European uh, Commission uh, the, the European Commission has, has taken statements in relation to this um, and has been quite active around, around this. Um, there's, a, a, of course, quite significant ratifica ratification in Latin America uh, as well um, and uh, uh, a few countries uh, in Africa. Uh, have ratified, none from the Gulf region to the best of my knowledge. Canada. Uh, Canada, um, I don't know. What I've understood is that uh, there's uh, real seriousness to the process of moving forward. One does not get to this stage without there being uh, a serious commitment to moving forward. Um, Canada has also um, re-emerged as a ratifier of international labor standards starting with Convention 98 in 1996 and then for the ILO centenary uh, the protocol uh, to Convention 29 and uh, another convention on uh, uh, um, labor inspection in uh, agriculture I believe it is but um, I, that might not be entirely right so my apologies for that but we've moved on ratification um, and this this is one that is, you know, where serious resources are being placed into assessing uh, the state of our laws. Canadian laws were influential in thinking through how Convention 189 should be uh, should be built. Um, Canadian laws were also. Um, well, let's just say there was an interesting moment around the live-in caregiver program where the convention uh, frames. Uh, live in in this way that domestic workers should be free to choose whether they live in or not which sounds so simple right of course except it really isn't right it calls deeply into question most of the schemes around the world including at the time our own and so Canada introduced a little amendment <laughs> <laughs> that was uh, not appreciated, and uh, d you know, but you could see, right? You could see where that that turn was going, and ultimately it was dropped. And not so long after adoption, even though Canada had not yet ratified, has not ratified, um, Canada modified the program and actually took out the live-in requirement. So, is, which is itself interesting. Is it a related? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, has it vastly improved domestic workers' lives in Canada? No, because the labor market shortage issue meant that domestic workers were still being told it's better to live in, right, if you want to get permanent residency after um, and told often by agencies. Um, but uh, the potential to change 
I think is quite significant. Um, even the process of thinking about ratifying in this way means that people are looking closely at the state of our law and what might need to be changed. Uh, the most significant dimension of the ratification is that a country may not be perfect in its laws, but it enters a learning community that includes the supervisory mechanisms which go over the law and practice in the country and offer uh, guidance, uh, but then uh, one enters a, a space of continuous dialogue around what to do and uh, other examples are drawn to light um, and uh, there's learning. So um, I think there's tremendous potential. The instruments are strong instruments. Uh, they cover a range of relationships. I think uh, it will be interesting to see what this might mean, for example, for collective bargaining uh, and uh, schemes that are in place in some countries, notably France, uh, to regulate domestic work in a way that uh, extends legislatively uh, certain kinds of conditions. So there are very interesting models if, um, if uh, Canada is and the different jurisdictions provincially, territorially are interested in thinking about how, how they might learn. So yeah, I think, I think it's, uh, it's important. Oh, uh, yes. We talked about transparency and domestic workers. Yes. And uh, this is a stupid question, but what do you think is the But what comes under the category of domestic workers? If I would assume the armas and uh, child minders and cooks and housekeepers and maids and I don't know how people live in South Africa, you should be afraid of the garden going. Yes. I also understand that it's not necessarily people that live in the house. Good. We people, we, the bus strike, right? Yes. The civil rights movement. Yes. Um, a lot of people, they, they commute it. So, and then of course the question is, and coming up with some standards and stuff, is if you live in the house, well, you, you've got a salary, um, but then you've got a room and board. Yes. You know, and that kind of thing, which is going to, how much is that? insurance, all of that other jazz. So yeah, I can see it's, it's very um, complicated. Mm -hmm. but, um, but also, um, what about personal caregivers? Yeah. Which in some countries, I think, would fall under that, whether it's for an Asian parent or a disabled uh, person or child or whatever. Um, so it, am I right in thinking it's all those kinds of things? <laughs> so that's a fabulous question and it won't surprise you that it's a question that consumed a significant part of the discussion in the first uh, year of the conference. Yeah. So let me Yeah. Residency problems yeah. and um, being cut off. Yeah. And the other thing that occurred to me was that you said invisible work. The only invisible, invisible work that goes on is invisible work that the women that choose to stay home and look after their own children. Yeah. It's yeah. When they go anywhere, they say, Oh, uh, do you work? <laughs> uh, <laughs> what do yeah. You do? Yeah, yes, totally. I'm just going to summarize because uh, I, I, mean, I should have had a, a, a mic so that everybody can some of the questions is clearly, but the question, maybe you can summarize it. Sure. Well. The question is about who gets captured yes. Yes. under that category and, and how it might be similar to, um, to uh, marine. Yeah. So um, let me read you the definition that was agreed upon. <laughs> 
And it starts like this. The term domestic work means work performed in and, uh, sorry, in or for a household or households, plural. Okay, so that's domestic work. The term domestic worker means any person engaged in domestic work within an employment relationship. Okay. And C, the bone of deep contention, a person who performs domestic work only occasionally or sporadically and not on an occupational basis is not a domestic worker. Okay, so you can already, just by that reading, get a sense of the tenor of the concern. So most of the categories you named are included, unless they're performing this work in light of C on the occasional or sporadic basis and not on an occupational basis. The not on an occupational basis was to avoid people who are already in really precarious work from being excluded, right? So you can see there was a back and forth on that. But there was a real concern not to create heavy categories of limits, put names on them, right, uh, 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 of the kinds of work because, of course, one, that may change. Two, they have very specific meaning in very particular contexts, right? Uh, but the introduction of the language of the employment relationship, although it provided some sense of clarity, also stepped the ILO right back into the challenge that surrounds so much of what we talk about when we talk about, well, who actually is an employee, right? You may be a worker, but so much of this work is done contractually. And in several of the jurisdictions, uh, including Switzerland and South Africa, what legislators have done is simply deem workers who do this work to be domestic workers, right? So uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it was understandably an issue that was deeply uh, important. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Go ahead. We're going to take these last two um, questions. Is it me? Yep. Yeah. Just a quick question, yes. possibly to, to follow up on yours. Is it who we contacted, like we were right to write a letter and encourage the, our own government, who would be yeah. advocating to, to? And I assume my, my MP, yes. Matthew, but nonetheless, um, some. What, where, what yes. Would yes. Doing? Thank you for that uh, fabulous question. So definitely your MP, uh, also provincially, uh, also uh, to uh, so rat although ratification ultimately happens federally, our Canadian approach in a matter that is within provincial and territorial jurisdiction is to ensure their buy-in on this as well. So your provincial, yeah, so this is, this is, yeah, it makes it, this is one of the reasons why it's taken us a long time to ratify a number of issues. So, so don't overlook your provincial uh, MPP. Um, also uh, writing to the, min you know, the social uh, development, Ministry of Social Development, so uh, our minister, yeah. And and uh, the, it, depending on, so that's been the lead, uh, but I think there are other uh, ministries that uh, will likely also uh, take uh, an interest. Uh, so uh, global affairs potentially um, uh, and immigration. Well, so, de yeah, so definitely labor, labor yes, um, but also <laughs> women, yeah. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah, there you go. But, uh, yeah, uh, but yes, and uh, there, there have been an important campaigns uh, that have been underway, so you can also sign on to, uh, to some of those, uh, uh, um, uh, yeah, to move this forward. <laughs> Sorry, this is in regards to this question directly. Yes. I am 
uh, in contact with our MP Matthew Green in regards to uh, McMaster's concerns, specifically with the Labor Department. Uh, if you wanted to pass anything along to him, here, feel free to contact him. Um, yeah, we directly converse on a regular basis. And, um, yeah, he's very interested in everything that we do within the Labor Studies Department at McMaster. So. Uh, anything that you want to pass along is, is more than appropriate to pass to me. Okay. Fabulous. My question more was um, just one international law of term. But, uh, maybe, you know, you can, I agree with you about the ILO frameworks, and uh, they're very helpful for dialogue and trying to push things forward. But I have a, a sort of a question is the term international law, because is it since there are no international courts except for the Hague, yeah. can we really call it international law? Because it's unenforceable, right? So what do lawyers, mm. how do you handle that? Do so, you hear that question? Yeah. Uh, so that's a, a you know fundamental question uh, around the field. Um, one of the interesting dimensions about that. Uh, question is that it speaks to the asymmetry in the architecture of international law. So if you were dealing with an international investment agreement, for example, it would have a place uh, to be adjudicated and it gets enforced in relation to states, right? So investors. So. Uh, so the you know the blanket concern about international law uh, is really uh, a concern that takes us more narrowly to specific branches. So international labor law, right. there are monitoring mechanisms. There are even measures uh, within the ILO Constitution that would allow a matter to be taken to the International Court of Justice. That hasn't been done. Yeah, and there's no, you know, so, and, the, and then the, so the enforcement dimension, one of the most interesting cases concerned forced labor was around Myanmar. Right. And it involved an Article 22 complaint in relation to the ILO's constitution. But ultimately, the ILO was in a position where it was able to authorize member states to take sanctions. Okay. So the US did. <laughs> so the question about is this law, I think, begs a different question. And that is, do states actually want it <laughs> to be law, right? And then um, one of uh, the dimensions that I think is making international labor law uh, more interesting to us, but also more contested, and I hinted at this earlier, is that courts are saying we take international labor law seriously. And so our Supreme Court uses international labor law now yeah. to understand the meaning of our rights. Regional courts are taking international labor law into account in very granular ways. And so, and of course then the decisions are, uh, are, are present and are frankly as enforceable as a WTO dispute settlement panel report or appellate body report. But we do things with those, yeah, right? That, exactly that. So WTO and look who's in. But these are the most marginalized people of yep. any society. Mm -hmm. yep. So even to get anyone to even represent them or to take interest in yep. an egregious issue or a workplace issue, even if it's Absolutely. And therein lies the rub, right? I think the frameworks yeah. are there. Yeah. But then the question isn't the law. 
right? So yes, because you're quite, yeah. So do, do I think labor is in an ace, you know, disadvantaged position globally? Of course, absolutely, yeah. right? But then let's talk about that. Okay. It's not the international labor law. And in fact, one of the few countervailing forces is the existence of this largely, for the fundamentals, highly ratified um, and really carefully monitored set of standards uh, that are pretty clear about some of the labor violations and about the kinds of things that you need to have. Yeah. <laughs> no, but I'm looking forward to this conversation. But the, I think the takeaway here is that we need to know about these instruments. We need to study them, take them seriously, not assume them away as papers, because they are as, if not more, central to our architecture uh, domestically and internationally as kind of some of the trade standards or the deeply contested investment standards. Yeah. So we need to be operationalizing them and thinking transnationally about them, which means thinking beyond them as well. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you.